A reading from the book of Exodus. The whole assembly of the children of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The children of Israel said to them, Would that we had died at the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, as we sat by our flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. But you had to lead us into this desert to make the whole community die of famine. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will now rain down bread from heaven for you. Each day the people are to go out and gather their daily portion. Thus will I test them to see whether they follow my instructions or not. I have heard the grumbling of the children of Israel. Tell them, in the evening twilight you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread, so that you may know that I, the Lord, am your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. In the morning, a dew lay all about the camp. And when the dew evaporated, there on the surface of the desert were fine flakes, like hoarfrost on the ground. On seeing it, the children of Israel asked one another, what is this? For well, they did not know what it was. But Moses told them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. The Jews murmured about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you. Whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, good evening. Today in the Carmelite calendar, we celebrate a rather new saint, Saint Teresa de los Andes, Saint Teresa of the Andes. And it was a great joy to get to know her um, as I prepared to celebrate this feast with you. And she was also one of the saints that I chose for um, our novena, even though I didn't know anything about her because I was like, oh, that'd be great. I'll learn something new. And um, mother said, so you, you have her on like Tuesday, would you actually like to do her on her actual feast day? And I was like, sure. <laughs> so that shows you how much I know about her before uh, starting to learn about her. She's a great saint, um, born in 1900, died in 1920 at the age of 19. Um, and I realized how old I was when I said, oh, 1920, that's not too long ago, and it's, it's over 100 years ago, but that's fine. It's, it's seems recent, right? Um, and she was made a saint by Pope St. John Paul II, I think in 1984, and she's the first saint of Chile. And she has this magnificent life. I won't be able to tell you all of it, even in those spare 19 years, but in short, she had a lot of struggles, and a lot of people really relate to her struggles, right? She was very proud, she was very vain, she was very stubborn, she had a harsh temper that she fought throughout her life, which I kind of appreciate. She said, uh, she has, we have a spiritual journal, and somebody was like following her, one of the mother superiors at her, um, one of the mother instructors at her high school was following her, and she just said, it made my blood boil. (laughs) Okay, so uh, she actually used that phrase a lot. Uh, Apparently, I haven't read this from her directly, but I read it on the internet. One time when she was 17, they gave her a piece of candy, and she didn't like the candy, and so she threw it across the room. So she had been struggling with this for a long time. Now, the reason I tell you this, and this is just a little tangent, is because a lot of times people like to know that our saints weren't perfect from the moment they were conceived and we have a way to relate to them like oh they struggled with the things i struggle with which is wonderful and it's an important lesson that we take from the saints but i want to encourage you um, not to just like focus on her flaws because I focus on the saints' flaws all the time, and I was like, I have so much in common with them. I don't have any of the virtues in common with them, but I have so much in common with them, right? I'm fat like Thomas, crazy like Francis, brusque like Basil, condescending like Jerome, and angry and sick all the time like Teresa. It's fantastic, okay? I'm sure God loves that in me. And, you know, we need to be careful that we actually look to her virtues, to the work that God was doing in her. And what God was doing in her was, of course, magnificent. He began to woo her at the age of six, 
so that already at the age of six, she was starting to have mystical experiences and begged to have received First Communion. And her mom said, you're too young. And that kind of refrain of, of reining her in is going to be a constant refrain throughout her life. She always wanted to do more. She always wanted to do greater. She always felt inspired to do incredible things, almost insane things, which is what you expect of a teenager in love. And, you know, always her superiors had to rein her in, and she was very humble and obedient in all of that. The Sacred Heart appeared to her, told her that she was going to become a Carmelite, and indeed she did. Um, despite great difficulty, despite numerous illnesses, despite um, the sisters who ran her high school telling her the Carmelites would never accept you, you're too sick. Um, she had uh, an, a sickness unto death every year for three years in a row on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. She almost died. And she struggled with her health a great deal. But the Carmelites took her and she was there for 11 months and entered into her last illness on Holy Thursday, made her profession in danger of death on the Wednesday of Easter octave, and died the day after what would become Divine Mercy Sunday at the age of 19. And so her very brief, passionate, brilliant, but brief life is why I wanted to think about her in connection with the title of him as Bread of Life. Because, dear brothers and sisters, it seems to me that in our preaching as priests and in many people's spiritual reading, we have not forgotten heaven, but tended to decentralize it. We'll talk about oh, you have this experience in prayer, oh, you grow in these virtues, oh, you never ask anything from the Lord, oh, you go out and help the poor. And the one driving love that inspired saints after saints after saints after saints, generation after generation after generation after generation, after generation is the one we barely talk about anymore, and that's heaven. And I'm going to come back to that, but let me just say a bit about St. Teresa of the Andes and heaven. Because she talked about heaven a lot, and she talked about heaven a lot in connection with Jesus and the Eucharist. In her spiritual diary, toward the end there, she compares Carmel to four places. To Bethany, where Jesus loved to stay with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and Jesus loves to stay with the nuns. To Tabor, where Jesus drew his chosen disciples up on the mountain, to show his glory to them. To Calvary, where he took the same chosen disciples into the garden and showed him his agony, showed them his agony. And to heaven. She compares the Carmel to heaven. I had to laugh that she compared it to every mountain except Mount Carmel. It was fine, it was okay, but wonderful, right? And she, why did she say that Cuomo was heaven? Certainly not that she had an easy time there. Certainly not that her life was pleasant there. She went through many struggles, even though she was always joyful. She said, Carmel is like heaven because we don't focus on anything but him. And he is present in the midst of my Carmel. And she wrote in a letter, she said, I can't tell you how incredibly consoling that is that I live in the same house as the Lord. That the perpetual Eucharistic presence is what made Carmel heaven. And that really struck me. I mean, a number of us priests, uh, we have this great benefit that a number of us have the Lord in our homes as well and I've never mistaken my rectory for heaven. And I realized that, you know, this is an incredible witness from this young saint. She also talked about the Carmelites becoming hosts, so victims from the Latin. 
But she, she comes very close to saying that each Carmelite becomes almost a Eucharistic presence, that Christ unites himself to him, to them, to the sisters so deeply that they become bearers of Christ the way that the Eucharist is. Now, that's not great Eucharistic theology. She didn't exactly get the Eucharistic theology right, but she was 19, and I don't blame her for that. Okay. But the spirituality there is profound. Right? It's profound that it's not we who are empty of God approaching the tabernacle which is full of him, but that we are meant to be filled with him so much that as St. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And she talked about not only heaven on earth and Carmel, but how much she longed to be in heaven. And in one of her letters she says, I think rather beautifully, that when we get to heaven, we will see that this life was just a blip of time. And then she says, thank God, because how could we ever survive it if it wasn't just a blip of time? And certainly in her life, which was weighed down with so many sorrows and struggles, even though she had a number of natural gifts as well, uh, that made a lot of sense. So let's come back to hungering for heaven. Jesus is the one who promises a reward numerous times in the gospel. The measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. You who have left everything and followed me will have a hundred times more on earth and eternal life in the world to come. And today in the gospel we hear, who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life and I will raise him on the last day. And we get a little nervous, I think. There's a reason why people don't talk about heaven so much anymore. One is because of the kind of assumption that I don't know where this assumption came about. It just Everybody just woke up one day and assumed it, that everybody goes to heaven. And if everybody goes there, then it's not really much worth thinking about, right? If it's automatic, it'll come in its own time. Whether everybody goes there or not, I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. But I do know that the effect of that belief has been to just say, like, it doesn't really matter that much. The second reason is because we get nervous about the idea of serving Jesus for the sake of a reward. We have this idea that, like, I should just serve him because he is himself. And that's absolutely true. But let me ask you who you think he is. If your spouse or your child or your best friend did a thousand things for you every day and you were just like, thanks, and made no return to them, would that make you a good person or a bad one? You don't have to shout out the answer. It's Cornwall. I know what you're thinking, okay? And if we know that if any of us acted that way, to look upon faithful service and give it no reward, we would never do that. How would we ever expect him? How would we ever expect him to look upon our fidelity, to look upon our sacrifices, to look upon our prayers, to look upon our faith, and just not care, I guess? And not reward us. And of course the reward is him himself. A deeper share in his love, a deeper share in his grace, a deeper share in his glory, a deeper share in his majesty. That's, that's the, the essential part of heaven. That's fantastic. But dear brothers and sisters, we need to remember that he has promised us a reward and he's told us to desire it. To not think that somehow we're doing better when we serve him and just expect him to be indifferent to it. And why do we have that struggle? And I'm going to offer you a, a speculation here. I think it's because, as Charles Piggy, the great poet, said, in the modern world, we're comfortable with faith. We may struggle with it, but we're comfortable with the idea. We're comfortable with love, especially with philanthropy and, and serving our neighbor. And we've forgotten altogether the third supernatural virtue that saves us, hope. 
And hope is not optimism for the world. Hope is not hope that I get a better job. Hope is not hope that somebody will be nice to me. Hope is hope for an eternal reward. Hope is hope for heaven. Hope is a thirst and a burning desire for heaven. And we've lost that connection somewhere along the line. And not only will we see him face to face in heaven with our souls, and this is real, he feeds us with his flesh and blood so that one day our bodies will rise from the dead too. We won't just be ghosts seeing God, we will be people, body and soul, filled with glory, risen as he is risen, conquering death as he conquered death. And our bodies on that day will be incredible, and it's all based or rooted in the Eucharist. And I find it very intriguing that both the Gospel writers and St. Paul, when talking about the resurrection, reach for one analogy. Do you know what that analogy is? Every time. A grain of wheat. A grain of wheat that falls and then rises. No more than us could they have thought about wheat without thinking about the Eucharist. And no more than us could they have thought about unleavened bread, which is unleavened, making it incapable of corruption, without realizing that that's a sign of the incorrupt bodies we will have when we rise from the dead. Dear brothers and sisters, I know we can't picture it, I know we can't even understand it, but we need to long for it. We need to long for heaven, we need to long for the kingdom that is to come. It's the second petition of the Our Father, thy kingdom come. We need to yearn for it, to hunger for it. For that day when he will raise us up, when he who will wipe away every tear from our eyes, where he will invite us to the wedding banquet of which this mass is both a foreshadowing and already a participation. Where our bodies will be radiant with light, incapable of harm, filled with dignity, and burning with power. And that's not me describing that. That's St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 15. Dear brothers and sisters, St. Teresa of the Andes went through a life of incredible pain with joy because her hope was fixed on heaven. I think so often we lack her courage and we lack her joy in times of sorrow because we lack her hope. And to look at that transformation from this life to the world that is to come, I want to, of course, as every night, reflect on the Blessed Virgin Mary, who in many ways, lived like a Carmelite. In fact, Teresa says that explicitly, that she's the most perfect Carmelite. I think she's the most perfect Benedictine, it's fine, right? But that she's the most perfect Carmelite, right? Um, and what do we see of Mary on earth? Not much. In fact, she was so unimpressive on earth that in the gospel today, we use the fact that the disciple of the Jews who believed in Jesus, who knew Mary, used it as a proof that Jesus wasn't anything special, right? Did y'all catch that? We know his mom and dad. How can he say he's the bread of life? Oh, well, if you knew them, right, maybe you might have an idea. But she lived a life of retirement, of quiet, of nothing special, so much so that we had to, many Catholics later in life would invent miraculous things to happen in Mary's life. We don't see that. She wasn't part of her son's ministry. She seems to have only been there at Holy Week because it was Passover and she was required to be there as a Jewish woman, right? And yet, now she's popping up all over the place and has been for 2,000 years. I mean, just to not put too fine a point on it, 
uh, I am the pastor of Our Lady of Lourdes. That's a pretty impressive miracle. She didn't do anything like it while she was on earth. In heaven, she who has been raised from the dead, she who has now her resurrected glory, the only one of the saints right now who's resurrected, she has that power to show us how amazing the transformation is from earthly life to heavenly splendor. And certainly within herself, she had all of that grace, all of that wonder. I'm not saying Mary was like a second-class citizen on earth. I am saying that we see now how incredible the transformation is, how incredible the hope we should have is when passing from this life to the next. Because we see the simplicity of Mary on earth and the glory of Mary in heaven. And so as we come to receive him who promises to raise us from the dead today, like St. Teresa of Andes, like the Blessed Virgin Mary, I encourage you to set your hearts on heaven, to yearn for the resurrection, and to burn with hope. God bless you all.